I'm, I'm going to put myself on mute in case my cat gets talkative. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we are live. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to wait just a second here. I think we still have people coming in. We have quite a large crowd today. Uh, and so you notice you probably had to accept that this uh, meeting is being recorded. So if you'd like to turn off your video, if you don't want to be recorded, uh, please do that. We ask that you stay muted, especially since we have a very large number of people today. Um, but if you do have any questions, um, you can put them in the chat and our uh, presenter will get to those at the end of his presentation. And we have um, time for those at the end. All right, we have some more people joining us. So I'll go ahead and repeat that real quick uh, before I introduce Helen. Um, so uh, we are recording the session today. So if you don't wanna be recorded, please, uh, you can go ahead and turn off your video. You'll find that in the three buttons on the top right hand of your uh, video stream. Um, we'll also ask you to stay muted during the meeting and we will be taking questions via the chat. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to those um, towards the end of the presentation. All right, and thank you all for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Helen with the uh, Dallas Environmental Quality Services Department, of the city of Dallas, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about what they do and then introduce our wonderful speaker today. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you everybody for spending your time with us. We're gonna have a awesome, awesome and super timely presentation today. And um, we, uh, we, are, we are probably gonna go over the hour just to let everybody know. But fear not, everyone who has pre-registered for the session will get an email in a couple of days that will have a link to let you access the entire recording. So if you are not able to stay to the very end, you can still get all of this information. And not only that, all of these sessions are also on the Dallas Public Library's YouTube channel. So you can also share it with uh, friends, and other gardeners who could benefit from this information. So with that, I'm gonna go through my presentation really quickly so we can get to the good stuff. Uh, everybody can see my screen, right? Most often used phrase of 2020 and 2021, there we go. So uh, my name is Helen Dulac. I am with the City of Dallas Office of Environmental Quality and Sustainability. And I am so excited to be partnering with the Dallas Public Library Seed Library on this series of classes called Grow With Us. So just to give you a little bit of information about my department, because you've probably never heard of it before, we, we started in 2004 and back then we were called the Office of Environmental Quality. We worked really hard for four years to help Dallas become the very first city in the United States to make a special environmental certification called ISO 14001. So what that means is we looked at our operations across 14 different departments in the city to see how we could still provide service with less of an impact on the environment. So we looked at our fleet vehicles, the fuel, uh, all the way to the paper we put in our coffee machines and we made changes and we make changes every year and we are actually audited every year to keep the certification. Now, what's also really cool about this is that this is Dallas, Texas we're talking about. This isn't a city in California. This isn't a city in Colorado. This isn't Austin. This is Dallas that did this first. All right, so Dallas does have a history of being green and we just wanna go greener. So let's fast forward to 2018 where a lot of changes happened to this department. There was a restructuring in the city and this department actually doubled in size. It absorbed some other environmental operations and programs and that's when we also changed our name to reflect that change. And that's when we became Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Also that year, uh, with, that, uh, with that merger, we created a combined outreach and engagement team that I'm a member of. And uh, the following year in 2019, Mayor Eric Johnson created the first city council committee focused on the environment called the Environment and Sustainability Committee. They just met this morning at nine o'clock. So they are the first Monday of every month. And those uh, meetings are uh, online and you can watch those. And it's a great way to keep the pulse, uh, keep a pulse on, the, on the, green, the green pulse of the city. And for example, today's meeting was a presentation by the Parks Department about their integrated pest management and how now all playgrounds in the city of Dallas are, are only treated with organic herbicides and pesticides. How about that, right? Who knew that? Uh, now, something you might have heard that came from my department is the uh, CCAP, the Comprehensive Environmental and Climate Action Plan that was adopted just on May 27th of 2020. And that is our roadmap for the next 30 years on how Dallas is going to get greener. You can see all 250 pages of that plan at dallasclimateaction.com. And as you'll see, a lot of the things that we do uh, are going to be in support of that plan, including presentations like today, 
because uh, there is a section on there about everyone having access to healthy food. So I mentioned that this department doubled in size and what you see in green are the new groups that joined us in 2018. I'm gonna talk about one of those just for a moment and that is storm water management. So storm water is anytime water leaves your property. It could be from the rain, it could be from your lawn sprinkler system, it could be from a hose that was left on. Now, there's nothing really wrong with that, but that water can actually pick up pollution as it travels across your lawn, down your driveway, into the street, and all the way down the curb to the big drain at the end of the street. So that big drain is called a storm drain inlet and it's there for one reason and that's to remove the water so the streets don't flood. We have about 70,000 of those in the city of Dallas and they do such a great job of removing that water quickly. So quickly in fact that water is not cleaned or treated. So if that water picks up uh, chemicals from your lawn, if it picks up bacteria that's in pet waste that wasn't picked up, if it gets some sort of automotive fluids that had dripped out of cars, that's how a lot of pollution actually ends up in our lakes, rivers, and our streams and a litter. Every time after rain, if you've ever driven by the Trinity River, that's when you see a lot of uh, litter along those banks because it's all washed in by the rain. So please be mindful about what you're doing outside and realize that pollution at your home or in your neighborhood doesn't always stay there. So I mentioned I'm a member of the outreach and engagement team and we want to help empower Dallas to save the earth and we do that by virtual presentations like this and in person when we're allowed. Uh, you can invite us to speak virtually to your club, HOA, uh, different kinds of organizations at no cost if you're in the Dallas area. We also have lots of different things for uh, students all the way from K to college. And we can also help you with seminars, activities, and events. If you invite us to talk, what do we talk about? Well, we talk about environmental topics from A to Z, all the way from air quality to zero waste. And we also host some of our own events. The most recent one was the Waterwise Landscape Tour that was back in November. You can see, uh, you can go on a virtual tour of zero turf homes. So these are homes that have no grass. Think about how much water and time savings that is, right? Uh, you can see those at savedallaswater.com. Uh, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. I just want to remind everybody we have a website called greendallas.net that you can visit. That's also where you can invite us to speak virtually to your group or organization by filling out the event request form. And of course, follow us on social media. We are Facebook, Green Dallas TX, and on Twitter and Instagram at Green Dallas. You'll learn about awesome uh, programs like this with the Dallas Public Library, uh, all sorts of other things that we're working on. And also, if you ever need to reach me or anybody on my team, all you got to do is drop an email to greendallas at dallascityhall.com and someone will get back to you. So with that, it is my ex extreme pleasure to introduce our speaker today. And this is going to be awesome. Uh, and this is uh, Larry Thompson. He is the Capel ISD uh, School Garden Coordinator. He is also a Dallas County Master Gardener. And not only that, he is a advanced Master Gardener with a specialty in vegetables. So I think he's gonna really be able to help us today. He is also a Master Composter. So he, you might have a couple composting questions for him. He is also a certified square foot gardener instructor with the Mel Bartholomew Foundation. And not only that, in his free time, he volunteers with the Capel Community Garden. So Larry, thank you so much for being here with us and I'm gonna pass it over to you. Good morning. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna share, correct? Yes, you're good like this. My wife says a green button, oh, there you go. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay, can you see me? Looks great. All right, there we go. Okay, so I am. A, I am a. First of all, I have to get the the, the, the non disclaimers out of the way. I am a Dallas County Master Gardener. I'm trained uh, through the Agro Life Extension Program through Texas A and M. Mm -hmm. One moment, please. <laughs> you, little, you, little, you little bugger. <laughs> One moment. No worries. Larry, we brought you in for your seed starting expertise, not for your Zoom expertise. So it's okay. Fabulous. So why is it advancing? Oh. Huh. 
Okay, so she's already uh, she's already given me this uh, this great uh, introduction, so I won't bore you with it again. But but I uh, I am in Capel. Uh, if you're not in the Dallas area, Capel is just north of Dallas. Um, we we are um, uh, in, still in Dallas County, but we're in four, uh, far north of Dallas. Oh, there it goes. Okay, so you would ask the question why why would I start start my own transplants and why do I why do I want to do seeds versus just going down to the um, uh, big box store and getting uh, getting what they have on the shelf well uh, part of it is it does save money and I put well maybe because you you can get a little technical and you can get over the edge uh, with start, starting your own seeds I'm not that person um, uh, my, my children say I'm cheap I say I'm thrifty uh, so I do, uh, I save my own seeds, uh, especially the ones that I go through year after year after year. In most cases, I do, uh, I do heirlooms. Uh, there are, there are some opportunities where, uh, where, where I, I'll do a hybrid, uh, especially when it comes to, uh, tomatoes in the, in the Dallas area. Uh, but I, my, but I do do that. So I save my own seeds. Uh, it gives you uh, it gives you uh, adds adds as variety and flexibility to what you want to uh, what you want to plant. Uh, many times, most of the time, especially if you're going to rely on the big box stores, uh, that they don't have what you what you're wanting to plant and the variety you want to, what you want to plant at the time that you want to plant. They're always either too early or they're too or too 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 far behind. So. This allows you that uh, that that flexibility, and uh, and it provides you with you have control. You have control about when you start the seeds, and then you have control about when you want to transplant those seeds, uh, uh, those the, your your new plants. So so you have control over it, and then it also it helps confirm uh, germination. So so if you I use I use tomatoes as an example, uh, it just because in in North Texas and. Uh, in the zone that we're in, uh, tomatoes are extremely difficult. Um, and you don't, you, and with a tomato, you don't put a tomato seed directly into the ground. You'll never get a tomato out. Uh, but it helps with germination and it helps with uh, being able to provide, um, to ensure that you actually have a, a plant that comes up and it's healthy and then you can transplant it when, when, when it's time. And not only that, but it's, you know, Starting your own seeds is just fun, and you can do it with children. I I like to do it with my grandkids. I like to do it with other kids. I like to do it in the schools. So that's that's why. Okay, so there's I'm going to stick to four basic topics. Part part of it, one of the most most important coming out of the uh, coming out of the gate is having a garden plan. Uh, then there's basic seed seed starting. Uh, uh, materials that you need. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about how to care for them once they germinate and and uh, and have and become have true what we call true true uh, true leaves. And then we'll uh, and we'll talk about transplanting. First of all, welcome to Texas, North Texas. We are in a zone called Zone Eight A. So we're not in Houston, we're not in Austin, we're not in East Texas, kind of. We're in zone 8A. 8A is, is rather unique uh, because it will get cold here or hot here just within a matter of a week or two. Uh, so we really have to pay attention. And when you do research or go on the internet, make sure that the person you're talking about is talking uh, specifically referencing the zone that you're in. Um, I also tell tell uh, tell people that I talk to start keep it simple. Just just keep it. My dad used to say, "Just kiss. Just keep it simple. Start small, um, and and grow the things that you that you would like to eat. So if you if you don't like okra, don't grow okra." Uh, but if you know this time of year, starting seeds for you know uh, cabbage and lettuce and et cetera, et cetera, those are those you can put in the ground rather quickly. Uh, uh, the way that the, the climate's going nowadays, um, uh, and then also understand the the 
uh, last spring frost date, which is March 15th. You got to kind of watch, got to watch the news and watch Mother Nature to make sure you're not going to, you know, it's, it, you're not going to get a frost afterwards. If you do, it's pretty simple in North Texas. You just, you can cover it with a freeze cloth. It's just a freeze cloth that'll go over your, over your outside, uh, outside garden bed. And, and it'll help you sustain some of the, some of the lighter frost that we have during that time. Uh, the first frost, again, extremely flexible. The average, just the average is about November 16th. So when was our, when was our first freeze? Well, Kind of depends on even what part of Dallas you might have been in. Uh, you could have been up in Denton and uh, you got a hard freeze. But here in Capel, here in Capel, I still grow. I'm still growing lettuce because I've got it covered with a freeze cloth. And you can extend your garden even longer um, through the season. Now, tomatoes, it's all gone. Uh, eggplant, it's all gone. Uh, the, that, that frost, that frost took everything out. But if you if you cover with a freeze cloth, you can extend or you can start your garden just a little sooner. And then uh, also, uh, I, I like local. Uh, big, there's nothing wrong with a big box store. Sometimes they have cheap materials and they have cheap transplants that you can get. There's nothing wrong with a, with a good box, big box store. Uh, but I also talk local, I like local nurseries. Uh, they have, they have well-trained uh, well-trained individuals there. They can help you with what grows well here in uh, in North Texas. Uh, they usually have the things that are go going to grow or going to go out first before the big box stores. And then you can always get them on the phone and talk to them and they have websites to help you out too. So I always, always talk about support your local nursery. They have, there's good, there's good employees, good people. A lot of them are or degreed horticulturist that uh, that can actually help you along. So uh, at the very bottom of this slide, I've got a website and I'm glad you know, she's going to record this. You can go back and pick this up really fast. Or if you got a fast pen, you can write this down. Uh, but but Aggie horticultural .tamu You go to this website. It has more stuff than you can read in a year. There's lots of information, lots of great information uh, that, uh, that'll help you with when to start, the variety to start, the varieties that are available, et cetera. And I got a couple of slides. We can, we're gonna talk about those here in a moment. But this website will get you to most anything, especially starting out, it'll get you to most everything that you need to know. Okay, so here we go. Okay, can you see that guide? You can't see the guide? We're just looking at your PowerPoint. You're still looking at my PowerPoint. Okay, if you're going to share a, a PDF document, you may have to reshare and select the... Yeah, hang on. So I'll get it. Stop that. Mm -hmm. and oh. then go to the right there. Mm -hmm. Ah, my lovely bride is helping me today. Mm -hmm. Oh, right there. Sleep. Now you see it, right? See the guide? Okay, yeah. here we go. Okay, so this this guide is uh, and the reason I did it because there's several pages of it. You just can't put this on a on a PowerPoint. But this is the this is this this is a guide from Texas A and M AgriLife, and it talks about all types of vegetables that you can grow. It gives you the depth of which you need to put it into the soil. Remember, I said soil, not dirt, uh, into the soil, and uh, and it also tells you that gives you the timelines of of when it's appropriate appropriate to plant. Now, again, you can go to the, the first frost date, the last frost date, and, and adjust your times based on, you know, what the forecast is potentially going to be. So one of the, one of the great things that I like to talk to people about is uh, this time of year is onions. Uh, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of folks that I, that I talk with and also uh, 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 
are in conference with, uh, they asked me, well, when, did, when, did you, when do you grow, when do you plant your onions? And I say, I, I plant my onions probably the first week of January, and I encourage you to do that. Well, where are you going to get onions? The onion sets the first, first week of January. You're not going to get them from the big box stores because they're still taking down the holiday stuff, right? Uh, but you can go to your uh, go to your local nursery, and they will already have the onion sets that grow well in North Texas on the shelf for you to get. And they come in little bundles of them, so you can get them. There's like fifty to seventy in a in a bundle. Uh, just last week, my lovely bride and I we planted 132 uh, onions. So uh, I'm a little ahead of the game because of the weather. I, we have beautiful weather now, so uh, we planted them. I just went and checked on them yesterday. They're doing great. So onions are a good a good time to start right now. Okay. I'm going to just kind of go down a little bit. And here it also talks about, it just it, it kind of sets up the variety. So there's, there's lots of varieties you can choose from. Uh, this is not the whole extent of the of a variety of of, um, of transplants or or vegetables that you can grow. There's there's a plethora of them, and I get uh, I get I get my seeds from a, a certain uh, a certain uh, manufacturer uh, because I've always had really good really good luck with germination. So find a good seed manufacturer, someone get a get a good seed catalog and start looking at it during the holidays and, uh, and uh, go out there and get your orders in. Uh, and, but understand ver understand the variety that you, that you're going to need. Okay. I'm going to go back to the, stop that. Look at that. There we go. All right. Okay. Yeah, where he talked about varieties. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for it to catch up now. Mm -hmm. Patience. He <laughs> did it again, didn't he? Have, have patience. I don't want to do that one. I just want to move on to. Huh. All right. Okay. So this is, uh, I thank my lovely bride for that. Uh, this is, this is what I create for the school. Uh, this is, there's not, not everything is in here. Uh, I always point out, you can tell there's no tomatoes in here in the springtime. Uh, I don't put tomatoes in the schools, in the school gardens, in the, or I limit the amount of tomatoes that we plant because uh, when, uh, when the school gets out on May 23rd, guess what's happening? That's when you're starting to fruit. That's when they're starting to really, really starting to produce. So, uh, so and they're, they're, they're gone for the, for the summer. So we don't we don't grow we don't grow tomatoes we grow a few of them because there's so, still some gardens that are active during the summertime that the teachers take care of but in most cases we don't so but you can do uh, here again you can do broccoli uh, if you go over to uh, where I've got it highlighted in spring uh, the um, uh, the the little eye that I have is you start them in you start them indoors and that's part of the seed pro seed starting process that we're going to talk about here in a moment. Um, you can even, believe it or not, you can even start radishes indoors uh, to get them uh, to get them to sprout. Also, to, to guarantee uh, 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 a seed germination, uh, you can do potatoes, not from a seed, but it's a seed potato. We do those. Uh, we do those in February, and we're able to harvest them before the before the, the students leave for the holiday, for the summer. Uh, so we do a lot of onions and a lot of potatoes and a lot of this other stuff that you're looking at. We do herbs. Uh, you can do start herbs on the on the on indoor and indoors also. Um, so there you go. So my point is create. You don't have to create a spreadsheet, but I like spreadsheets. You can create a list 
uh, for yourself of what you want to grow, what you like to eat, uh, and then go to these uh, go to these websites and uh, and and figure out what will work for you, and then and then there you go. I know I'm making it kind of simple, but it really is pretty simple. If you'd asked me that about ten years ago, I'd have went, "What? It's not simple." Okay, so uh, basic seed starting. I use uh, I use a, a seed starting media. I, I don't just use this potting soil. Potting soil has lots of material in it. They got they got big pieces of wood, which is they is mulch. Uh, but if you're going to repot a plant or repot something, potting soil is great. Seed starting mix is different. It's uh, it's it's very fine. It's got a lot of co cocoa core in it. I'll have a spreadsheet talking about that. Um, so, so that's what you do. And you don't go out in the backyard and dig up your dirt and try to put that in and put the seed in it. That, that, that's a failure. That won't work for you very well at all. Um, then we're going to talk about containers and trays. I've got my, uh, I got my grow, uh, grow kit kind of set up in the background behind me. We'll, I've got pictures of that in the spreadsheets. We, I mean, the, in the PowerPoint, we can look at those. Uh, we're going to talk about seed depth. Uh, that's extremely important. Yes, it is. Uh, talk about moisture, lighting, and then uh, and then heat, and and when that's when it, when you need to do that, and when it's when it's an appropriate time to use all of those. Okay, seed starting mix. I uh, I try not to give people too much uh, brand names to use. I've used so many of the different brand names. Um, I, if I tell you one brand name, there's going to be five that will get upset with me because I didn't use theirs, but, but, and I'm a creature of habit. So once I find one that's good and it has worked for, works good for me, may not work good for you, but it works good for me. I go back to the same one over and over and over because it, it does work. What I have found through the years is that, uh, the seed starting mix that you want to use um, to have cocoa core in it. And that kind of holds, holds the, the media together. Um, you are unmuted by a host. Okay. Um, sorry. I just read the screen. Uh, also there's a difference between the vermiculite and the perlite that's in the uh, SARDS uh, uh, seed starting mix. For my personal use, I prefer vermiculite there's a lot of it uses perlite but i like vermiculite vermiculite will actually absorb moisture and then release it perlite does not do that perlite what it does it just it just helps with uh, uh with keeping uh keeping it broke apart and helping when you actually do the transplanting perlite's good but my for my personal personal use i do use uh i do use vermiculite um in the seed starting mix, even, even the ones that I have found that I really like that works well for me, uh, I uh, sometimes I'll, I call it double sifting. I'll put it through a sifter so that it's, it's really fine. Uh, I take out the little sticks that they leave in it and I'll take out the rocks that they've left in it and, and et cetera. Um, that works, it works, again, it works well for me. It, 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 with the vermiculite, you can put the moisture in and it holds the moisture well and helps the seed to germinate. Uh, again, when you go to YouTube, there's going to be a, a bazillion ways that people do this. I, I do this. I'm a home. I do this at home. This is not on a commercial level. They do things differently. And, uh, and this just works for me. Uh, and again, I just, and I sift it down to, to when it's really, really fine. Oh, there's a little example I've got there on the far left. If you're looking at the screen, the little white pebbles in it are um, that's perlite, and it works well. Uh, uh, but if you but if you want need the little extra moisture in it to, to kind of hold it together, um, then uh, then use the vermiculite. The vermiculite that I use uh, is 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 a it's a commercial grade. And it's really fine. It's not really fine. It's kind of a light, a fine to medium coarse uh, grade. Um, and and here again, sometimes uh, sometimes if I want to get it even finer, then I'll 
then I'll grind it down and I'll uh, I'll get it even finer. But uh, but this is this is how I do this. And what do you put it in? I, there's again, I you know I keep using YouTube, but you can go on to YouTube and it make you scratch your head and you go, I don't know why they use that kind of stuff, but but they do. I've seen them use it use an eggshell. So they'll take an eggshell and cut it in half, and they'll put a little bit of soil in the eggshell to put the seed in. That's perfectly fine if you you know if you really want to do that, go ahead. I uh, to me that's it, it's kind of gets in the way. Um, so I, the black uh, the black pots that I have those are readily available through a lot of locations. You can uh, uh, you can get them at a uh, at a at a nursery, you can get them at Amazon, you can get them uh, big box stores. There's, there's just all kinds of stuff you get. My preference, and I have another slide on, my preference are the white ones. So if I'm doing tomatoes, they're going in the white pots because they're bigger, more control over it, there's more control of what, how much, uh, how much uh, root, uh, root base you can get. So uh, in the middle, then we've got uh, toilet rolls and yes, I had when I started out because I'm thrifty. I started out using some of these toilet rolls, and it and they work just fine. Uh, the downside for me for a toilet using a toilet roll is they absorb a lot of moisture. So you got to continuously put moisture in it to make sure that these that the seed and the plant stay moist. Um, but then you can just take the toilet roll, plop it into the into the soil outside into your garden, and it'll grow just fine. It grows just fine. The next one is just, uh, they're just cardboard pots. You can also get pots that are, they call them cow pots. And again, big box stores, Amazon, nurseries, they've all got them. And, uh, and the cow pots add, add nutrients to the soil. After you put your transplant in, you just put the whole thing in um, with the bottom tore out of it. But you put that in and it just add, helps to add nutrients. Uh, the far right hand side, I still have a bunch of these. Uh, a friend of mine gave those to me and he said, I, you want these? And I went, sure, I'll take them. He gave me, he gave me several. I still have several left. Uh, you make, when you, when these get moist, they expand and they get bigger and you can put your seed in that also. They're really, really convenient. I don't like the texture and I, I don't like, I don't like the output of those. So I, I've used a couple of them, but I don't, uh, I don't use them anymore. So but I needed to show those because those are available and, uh, and they're easy to store. Okay, seed start, your seed starting mix. Now, whatever you use for your seed starting mix, uh, uh, what I do, not everyone does that. Again, I refer back to YouTube. Not everybody does this, but this is what I do. I put the seed starting mix in a, in a container and, it, and I get it moist. And it's all moist before I ever put it in the pot, or whatever, or whatever mechanism you want to use to grow your grow your plant in. So I'll get it moist. I'll walk away from it for about thirty minutes, and to make sure that it is moist because it will absorb all the moisture that you put in it. And then I'll take it in my hand and I'll squeeze it, and I want a couple of drops just to coming out it coming out of my fingers. If it does that, I'm good. If not, I add more water to it. I walk away again for 30 minutes. I come back and I check it again. The reason I do that is I want that soil to be moist all the way through. If you if you just add water to it after you put it in the pot, just add water to it. It it there's going to be voids inside of that. So, so and this is how I do it to make sure that it's good and moist. And then all I have to do is come back occasionally, check for moisture, and then just can kind of add moist add water to it. Okay. Hope that makes sense. So that's, uh, that's, I put one of these together real quick. That's what I do. Pretty simple, 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 simple. You just put the soil in there, let it go. Um, uh, then we're going to talk about seeds. So now this is just an example. So a lot of the questions that come, that come about are how, about the depth of putting a seed there, there are several. There are several different types of seeds that I, that I like to pay attention to. Uh, the first one we'll talk about is just the squash. So the squash is a big seed. It's 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 pretty big. Um, you need to plant it about a half inch deep. 
Uh, uh, so when I plant it a half inch deep, then you got a little void on the top of the soil. Uh, that really fine, really fine um, uh, seed starting mix that I created, I'll just sprinkle it over the top and make sure that it's covered a little bit and we're good to go. And then I'm, I'm, I'll make sure that it stays moist and it will germinate with no problem. Uh, the next one I, I chose, and this one's really, really special, is this one is, um, uh, it's like carrots and lettuce. There, there are seeds that are like, I call it like, they're just like dust. They're so small that you sneeze and it'll all just kind of disappear. Well, you can add a bunch of those to it, uh, to, your, to your soil mix. Uh, I do not plant them deep. I don't stick my finger in and, and make a hole and sprinkle it in. Uh, what I do is I just sprinkle it surface. I call them surface uh, planting. I just sprinkle it on top of the surface and then I'll come back and, uh, and take that really fine uh, uh, seed starting mix that I've got and I'll sprinkle it across there and then I'll just use my water. I'll show you what I used to water it with and I'll just water it and make sure it's watered in and they three or four days later, here they come. Um, here's the part I want, to, I want to pay attention to. Read the package. There is so much information and I was kind of bullheaded way, way back when especially when you go to the feed store and you're just pulling seeds out of a bin that doesn't really have any instructions where they don't how to plant stuff. Uh, but read the package. The package has got a lot of great information. This in particular will tell you how deep, how deep to plant it. Um, the seed depth for seeds, seeds are kind of like that dust seed. They're just really small. I just sprinkle a few on top and then I'll cover it with the fine, with my uh, fine, uh, fine mist, fine, um, uh, soil that I created and, and watered and good. This also will tell you if it's frost hardy. It is. Uh, you can plant carrots uh, this time of year as long as you cover it with this freeze cloth really, really easy and they'll grow and you'll have, you'll have carrots pretty fast. It does take six to eight hours of sunlight. All that's right here, right here on this list and it tells you how far apart to put them. Um, read the seed package. It tells you a bazillion amount of information that you need. And then you can go off and go look on the internet for other stuff. Okay, seed care. Uh, seedlings, we're doing it with time, we're good. Seed care, um, uh, once you get everything planted, then you need to pay attention to seed germination. Don't, don't plant your seed, don't, don't make your make your soil in your pot and put them in the back and just forget about them. You need to go back every day, even if it's just for a few moments and take a look at it and make sure that you got good, you're starting to get good seed germination. Uh, as my, my lovely bride would tell me, I, I need to have more patience because I don't have as much patience as I used to. Um, so she said, have more patience and just give it more time. Make sure that your, your water level is good. Don't overwater them. Keep them moist and just monitor it. Um, lighting, and I, we're, we're, I'm probably going to get a lot of questions about lighting because, again, YouTube and the Internet is full of questions about special spectrum lighting and et cetera. We'll talk about, as much as I know, we'll talk, we can talk about that. Uh, but um, uh, when, when you get true, true leaves, which is the, the seed germinates, grows it's going to get a second set not the first set the second set of leaves when it comes then put your light on it um and that's uh and once you put put the light on it then it'll begin to grow because it that's what it's after is going after the light um and we mentioned true leaves now heat mats this is how i do it i don't use a heat mat for things like lettuce and cabbage um leafy vegetables. I don't use a heat mat for that. I do use light, but I don't use a heat mat. I use a heat mat for the things that need more heat. Tomatoes need more heat to, gen to germinate and to grow. Uh, peppers, hot peppers, bell peppers, they need more heat. Uh, eggplant needs more heat. We grow a lot of eggplant. We grow a lot of bell peppers, etc. So, and those need, those need more heat. So a heat mat I limit those to a couple. I got four shelf uh, tower. I limit those to two of them, and then we're and then I, that's all I do. The rest of them are for leafy vegetables. Okay. 
here's what I water with. I don't use, this is on my tower, on the shelves that I have behind me, this is what I water with. So once I get the soil moist, it's in the pot, I plant it, and when I go into, 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 my, into my room to uh, water these, I use this, this, I use this water bottle. And I got these nozzles from, oh, here it comes, Amazon. I got eight of them in a package for a couple of bucks. This works great. There's just enough water coming out of these little tiny hose that helps to keep the, the top of it moist. And this is when we're first try, trying to get them to germinate before they get their true leaves and start growing and talk about watering that later. But this is what I use. It's really simple. And this is what's behind me. This is my grow light. So I got a, I got a four tier grow light. This thing, I've had it for a long time. Uh, I did change, uh, I did change some light fixtures here. I, uh, I went to uh, Amazon and, and I got the, I got the, the special light spectrum on the top two. And these are the top two that I use for, uh, for growing lettuce and cabbage and spinach and those those types of things. Uh, there's no heat mats in them, so I limit that to that. Now you can see that that's not real big. It's like they're a couple of feet wide, uh, but you can grow a lot. You can grow a lot of uh, seedlings in those two shelves, a, a bunch. Uh, the bottom two are standard fluorescent grow bulbs. They're not really special spectrums or just, uh, just call them, they're just light bulbs. Um, I use those for tomatoes, eggplants, peppers. Those lights put out a lot more heat. The, the top two, no heat whatsoever. The bottom two put out a lot more heat. And with the, with the heat, along with the mat that I have, which will go about seven, between about 75, maybe 70 to 75 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, um, that it will help it will help them grow and help them germinate quicker and 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 they just do a lot just just a lot better just a lot better they and that again just me that's what i do here's the heat mat and here's just the heat mat that i use um i'm thrifty i got that from probably one of my favorite stores which is called let me think amazon but uh, uh, but this is what I use, and um, it, it works well. I've had this for several, several years. When I'm done with it, I wipe it down just to, just to make sure that it's, it stays clean, and, uh, uh, and this is what I use. And it works, for me, it works extremely well. Okay, we'll talk real briefly on, uh, let's see, I'm doing on time pretty good. We'll talk about transplants. Uh, most transplants do well when they're about four inches tall. Uh, I'm not talking, but tomatoes are different. I let my tomatoes get a, a lot taller than that before I actually put them out. I don't let them get leggy, but I let them, uh, but I let them grow a little, little better and let the stem get thicker. Uh, but the, in most cases, four in, when, the, when the true leaves get about four inches tall, they're ready to go outside. Um, uh, let's see. In the garden outside, try to think ahead. Uh, if you're going to put, I, I don't recommend putting stuff in the ground in North Texas. I just, I just don't. I've tried it. It's awful. It takes forever to get the nutrients to, to start to generate for the, for the plants. Uh, I do raised beds. Um, I control what goes into the bed with the raised beds. This is beyond this, this course. But, uh, uh, but I do raised beds. I control what goes into the raised beds and I control what nutrients go into the raised beds. Um, so just, just, but if you're gonna put them in the ground, it, uh, just make sure that all the weeds and the rocks and all the debris is out of the way. And you know, and if you're gonna put one in the ground, if you're gonna dig up your backyard, you might ought to call Amos, uh, 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 Atmos Energy and all those other people and the cable guy because you'll wind up digging something up, I, I guarantee it. Why, why? How do I know that? Because I'm digging something up. So, uh, so just make sure that you, uh, you know, call somebody before you start digging in the yard. Um, uh, soil testing. 
whether it's raised beds or if it's in the ground, get a sample of your soil and send it to Texas A&M. And since this is recorded, you can you can go in and get this uh, get this website, soiltesting.tamu.edu. This will save you so much time, so much heartache, so many failures. Just I could go on and on and on. So if you send a send a soil sample into Texas A&M, they'll analyze it for you. They'll send it back to you, and it'll tell you what you need to do to get the soil ready. To, for your transplants to go in and, and grow optimally, okay? We're getting to, close to the end, don't drool too much. This is the, this is the greenhouse uh, in Capel. Capel has three community gardens. I, I volunteer at one of those gardens, uh, but this is the greenhouse that feeds those. Uh, they also uh, take these, uh, these uh, Plant transplants and they'll sell them at the Capel Farmers Market in the springtime. So you can go to the uh, capel.gov and it'll tell you how often uh, that they have the the farmers market and these will be the there for sale. These are fantastic. The volunteers are all volunteers that that, that work in this uh, in this greenhouse work really hard. Uh, these are beautiful transplants. They're well nourished going out and when they go in the ground, they, they take off. They're in really, really good shape. So, so I'd mention that. This is the sample of the, uh, the Texas A&M uh, uh, soil sample. So I send in uh, soil samples, uh, if not every year, at least every two years. My personal garden, I send it in once a year. I, I want a snapshot of what it looks like and what I need to add to it. If you're doing organic, and, uh, and, I, and I hope everyone here is uh, at least trying to experience some of that. If you're doing organic, organic takes longer um, for, the, uh, for the amendments to break down in the soil uh, than it does with an encapsulated synthetic. Uh, I'm not saying anything bad about synthetic, but for, for my use and for the community gardens and the school gardens, we're, we're organic. Um, so and so this is what you need and you need a you need ahead of time so when do you think i would send a soil sample in to texas a and m i'll send it in three months before we really start planting uh, that way the soil sample gets comes the analysis will come back i'll look at it for the gardens i'll add the amendments and it takes about two to three months for it all to start breaking down evenly and be ready for the transplants you do that, you'll be successful, okay? And uh, let's see, hey, I'm doing pretty good at time. So I am uh, I can take uh, take questions. So if anyone has any questions, send them, uh, send them their way and they'll, uh, they'll work, work it out. All right, Larry, thank you. And we do have some questions. And of yes, course, yes. I'm going to encourage everybody to add your questions to the chat because we have Larry here uh, he's agreed to stay uh, until 1.30. Uh, and so take advantage of this opportunity for our Q&A. All right, so Larry, you talked about like seed starting mix, right? That you need to have uh, the right kind of soil so to have the best germination. So uh, what about like getting some sort of seed starter mix that you can purchase at the store? Uh, do you recommend these or do you recommend making your own mix? That's a great, great question. So uh, this, this presentation is on uh, the basics. So if you're just starting out, I highly recommend it. You just go get, she just showed a, a, a thing of Jeffy, which is good stuff. Um, um, uh, Nature's Care is another one. It's good stuff. Uh, uh, Kellogg, uh, yes, like the cereal, but it's, they're, they're, it's Kellogg. They make a great uh, a, a seed starting and potting soil and seed starting mix also. Um, I, I, would, I would recommend basics to start out that you go get something that's already made and, to, uh, and try your hand with that first. I personally, I mix because I like vermiculite. I I I, I mix my own. 
sometimes. You know, I didn't realize what you're talking about, the difference between uh, perlite and vermiculite and about how the vermiculite releases the moisture. Yeah. And so I ran outside because I'm like, oh, I have these things. So I do have the perlite, right. but right. I realize I don't have any vermiculite. Yeah. And so that might be something I'm going to look into. Now, um, I am really a beginner when it comes to starting seeds. And so I've seen some of these, uh, like these charts, like you shared earlier. But you know what always confuses me, Larry, is how do I know the date on that chart? What is it for? Is that when I start my seeds inside? Is that when I put the seed in the ground? Is that when I put a transplant outside? Sometimes I just don't understand what the date is telling me. <laughs> you have some really good questions. Uh, so the, the, the Texas A&M website will show transplants. So if you, if you see one of their charts, Typically, what they're talking about is when to put it in the ground. Uh, so let's uh, so let's say that you want to do lettuce, and and it goes in, and they say you can put it in the ground three weeks before the last frost. Um, they they're also talking about doing seeds, so you can do seeds or you can do transplants. Um, so you just back the date up it's like running up kind of running up a, a project gantt or something you just back that up uh a few weeks before uh before they're ready to, before it's uh, available to go outside and it'll and it'll be ready for you does that answer your question i think so i okay so i guess it, and you know a lot of times when you just google stuff it pulls up a c chart but it doesn't pull up the page that explains what the, the, you know, the planting chart, I'm sorry, is all about. And I think like, that's what I'm missing sometimes is that the standalone document doesn't have all the details, but you know, but you know, you're right. Find some trusted sources and go with those sources. And yeah. then, you know, and also those sources will have a consistency, you know, like you're mentioning, like how uh, Texas A&M is going to have, you know, most of their charts are going to be basically the same, you know, they're going to, and so that's a that I think that's going to help me a lot. Okay, so we're having a lot of questions about your seed starting mix. Do you mind sharing like your recipe for your seed starting mix? No. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> uh, yes, I can do that. Uh, so the people that are asking that are they beyond basic? Uh, I am not a hundred percent sure, but okay. um, I, I, I'm not sure. So here, here's what, uh, here's what I do. I, I will use a seed starting mix. Uh, I will add the vermiculite to that. I will add, um, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, uh, a material called, it's just, it's cocoa core. So it's, it's coconut fibers. So I use cocoa core in order to hold, actually to, to hold, hold it together. Um, so I make sure, I do make sure that it's got cocoa core in it. Not all seed starting mixes do the pre premier ones do the premium ones do that. You're going to spend a little more money. They'll have cocoa core in it. Make sure that the cocoa core is in there. Make sure the vermiculite is in there. If it doesn't have vermiculite, I will add the vermiculite to it. You know, that's a, that's a good point, Larry. You know, you can, you know, you know, I can buy a seed starter mix, but that doesn't mean I can't add to it, you know, that I can't, uh, you know, customize it. And that's absolutely right. You know, I didn't even think about that. So simple. Okay. So we also have a lot of questions about like fertilizing your, your starts, you know, I mean, so once your seedlings start like using a liquid fertilizer, you know, should it be high in nitrogen? How often could you address that, please? So, okay, so this is we're we're back to being basic again, and we're uh, we're we're seed starting, and we're we're just starting to germinate the uh, the 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 seed. So once once the seed or once the plant gets the true leaves, which is the the second set of leaves that it has, um, I do fertilize. Uh, I don't use synthetic. I use um, I use um, a fish emulsion. I use uh, an ounce of fish emulsion per gallon of water. 
I also use an ounce of unsulfured molasses per gallon of water. So I just add them all together and it's one gallon of water. So that's fish emulsion and um, uh, molasses. And it's unsulfured molasses. So don't, don't go to the store and, and get syrup or something. Make sure that it's, uh, it's unsulfured molasses. Absolutely. Okay, so we also have a lot of questions about the soil test uh, that you mentioned. Okay. Um, I, I will get, we'll put the link in there for the soil test, but there okay. is a cost, a minimal cost to the soil test, and there's also multiple tests you can choose from. Do you have some advice about which test that we should run on our soil? That's a fantastic answer. So the cheapest one is $12, and I mentioned I'm thrifty. So the cheap, the cheapest uh, analysis is twelve dollars, and then it's another six dollars to uh, to mail it to them. Uh, so it's about about twenty dollars to uh, for for the analysis. Um, I used I used the very first one. I used the cheapest one. This is twelve bucks. The only thing that I'm really interested in is the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the uh, potassium. It's NPK. Those are the only three that I'm personally that I'm interested in. If I'm going to go any deeper than that, um, that's uh, then then it's, it's a lot more expensive. It's like it could be up, upwards in the like thirty six dollars or something for an analysis. If you really want to do that, then you can. But I I for me for my personal use uh, for the schools and for the community garden, I I keep I keep it simple. I just do NPK. All right. Do you happen to know if that soil test tests for nematodes? No. Yeah, I wasn't sure on that one either. They do have, I just put a link in the chat and they do have one, two, three, four, five, I think five different tests that you can choose from. And uh, hopefully one of those can test if you're interested in testing for nematodes or some other things can help you with that. And I also think there might be, um, I'll see if I can find a uh, like an email that maybe you can email somebody there to ask those questions too. Okay. Are they, are they referring, when they're talking about nematodes, are they referring about bad nematodes? Are they talking about root knot nematodes? What, what are they referencing? I think they're talking about the bad nematodes, wanting to know if they have those bad nematodes in their soil. Okay. All right. So we also have a lot of questions about like, uh, people seedlings are getting leggy. Uh, so if you can talk about like, you know, do they need stronger lights or, or do they need to adjust the distance to light? Now also about dampening off, if you could talk about that. Uh, hardening off? Yes. Yes. So the, the lighting first, um, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about tomatoes. Tomatoes aren't always the easiest vegetable or fruit to start with as a beginning gardener. They're a lot of fun and they're, and they're very, if you're successful, everybody has a great time, but they're not, they're not the, the most user friendly to go after in the beginning. But let's talk about tomatoes. So that my tomatoes will come up and uh, they get the, uh, as soon as they germinate, uh, they get the second leaves on them, uh, the true leaves. It, it takes days for that to happen. I will make sure that the grow light is dropped down as far as I can. And I've got chains on mine I've, that I, I bought to, to adjust it. So the light, the, I put the light down as close to the plant without actually touching the plant as, as it can. So that's the, that's the light adjustment. That's keeping it from getting leggy. As soon as it, as soon as it germinates and breaks the soil and begins to get the true leaves, it, it wants to go to the light. Follow the light. So that's where it, that's what it, that's what causes it to uh, to get laggy. All right. And then how about some tips for hardening off and also maybe explaining what that even means? Uh, hardening off is uh, um, let's uh, as an example, let's talk about March. So March is kind of a on again, off again cool cold weather before we finally finally get into this uh temperature uh at night is over you know 50 degrees as an example so if you're going to put out if you're going to put those out 
So you're taking them from an environment. My office is a good example. My office is, I don't know, 65 degrees or 70 degrees. And I'm going to put them outside, whether it's a lot hotter or a lot cooler. You want to take them out for a few hours a day or just a day and then bring them back into the house. And that actually helps them harden off. It helps them get used to and adjust to the, uh, to the, to the climate that they're actually going to be in. So this is the thing about big box stores is they have them they have it constantly in an environment of where people walk around all the time. So it's rather comfortable. You take them and you put them outside and the temperature is 15 to 20 degrees hotter outside than it is in the big box store. It won't, they won't last. They, you can't pour enough water on them. They just, they just won't be able to adjust and, and last. So we, so I actually, if I, when I buy stuff like that, I'll make sure that they, they're hardened off before I actually put them into the ground. All right. So, okay. So we have some people who have greenhouses or have questions about temperature and even, so the air temperature and also soil temperature. I'm, I'm so, jealous. If they yeah. have a greenhouse, I'm jealous. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so for example, um, someone has a mini greenhouse and they have a 200 watt heater and a programmable thermostat. Do you have any advice about setting up temperature monitoring? And then also someone else was asking, could you use a space heater instead of a heating, uh, uh, you know, the mat? And, and then uh, just basically um, like how important is soil temperature for when you're starting seeds? When you're starting seed, again, we, we're talking about uh, for me, um, for tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, et cetera, I put the heat mat down because I, I want that soil to be at about 70 to 75 degrees. They germinate faster. They get the, the root, the, the, the roots are, are, are thicker and better and it helps the plant more. Uh, for lettuce, cabbage, those types of things, I don't, I just have my, 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 the room that I have them in, there's just the house temperature. I do not, I do not, and I don't heat that soil for that. Outside temperature is important. If you're going to direct seed into the soil outside, uh, make, make sure that they that you follow the guidelines from Texas A&M. Typically, it's so at least uh, depending on the seed, it's at least over 50. The soil needs to be over 55 degrees and 60 degrees. If you're going to do okra, it needs to be 70, 75 degrees. So again, it depends on the variety or it depends on the type of a, a vegetable that you're going to put in the ground. You know, you're absolutely right, because, you know, uh, you, what, probably one of the golden rules of gardening is you want to grow what you like to eat. But there are a lot of vegetables that grow better in different seasons. So, like, for example, uh, like, like cilantro and tomatoes and peppers, right? So you want to make salsa. And those are like, and, and onions, right? So those are like the main ingredients for salsa, right? right? But your peppers and your tomatoes do really good when it's warmer outside. But cilantro doesn't. Cilantro will bolt or die when it gets too hot. So it's like this nature's cruel joke, right? That you really can't make salsa. <laughs> you know, because that is that is funny, but you're absolutely correct. Yeah, it's timing. Again, as one of my one of my slides said, timing is timing is everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so for some of those vegetables that like it warmer, they're gonna need a warmer soil temperature and you might need to wait a little longer before you put them outside, you know. Right. But some of these cooler season crops, like you're talking about the lettuces and the cabbages and those things, they, they can handle, like you mentioned, that 50 degree soil temperature when these tomatoes and these other things might need 70 degrees. And yes. so um, do you have a, is there a, a soil temperature chart perhaps that we can share? Texas a and I, I don't have one in my slides, but Texas A&M does have a chart that, uh, that, that, will, that tells you what the soil temperature should be. Uh, I maybe let me look at my let me look at my other my other chart to see if it's in there. All right. So while you're doing that, uh, so we had some more questions about soil testing, and I think even some of our uh, so, some of the people uh, watching the presentation have, have, have chimed in on this. Is should you soil test different parts of your yard or just where you're growing? And what about vegetables versus like flower gardening?
So um, while Larry's looking that up, I can tell you a little bit about if you're wanting to add like native flowering plants to your landscape, you can actually, since they are native, a lot of them can handle our clay soils. So you don't necessarily have to do a lot of amending to flower beds. It kind of really depends what kind of flower you're planting uh, to the requirements that flower needs. So if you're, if you're wanting to recreate a prairie, you know, or use some of those prairie type flowers in your landscaping, those thrive on the soils we naturally have. If you wanna use a different type of flower, uh, then you know, you'll have to amend those soils. And a lot of times you can do that by adding compost uh, into your soils and mulching and having those nutrients break down and help with your flowers. And I actually have seen a soil temperature chart before from uh, Texas A&M. I just, I, just, I just have to see if I can find it and share that. Um, oh, and so Larry, what do you think about using a space heater to help heat, start your seeds? Is that gonna be helpful or does that heat need to come from the bottom and come from a mat? Oh, did Larry freeze on us? He might have froze on us. Okay, so um, let's give him a minute to uh, reconnect with us and let's tackle some more of these questions we have. So thank you guys for uh, putting in uh, so many different questions. Um, so we have some questions about good sources for soil. So we did have a, a presentation uh, with Dr. Joe Masabni. Uh, not that long ago, and he talked about container gardening, and he had some recipes for his uh, soil mix he uses in containers. Um, and so that is available on the Dallas Public Library's YouTube page. And then also, uh, we had Jeff Raska, who gave a pre presentation about container gardening, and he had some recipes for uh, his soil. And he basically uses topsoil, pine bulk mulch, and compost. And he basically uses those in even ratios and uses that to fill his raised beds. And he has had a lot of success with that. And topsoil and pine bark mulch are not that expensive. So it's um, a little bit more affordable way that you can build some soil for those raised beds. All right, Larry, I see you're back on with us. You'll just need to unmute. Just, that was just gone. All right, there you are. That's okay. Um, okay, so, um, so some other questions we have are, is a little bit about, you You talked about watering your seedlings. Yes. And so you showed that neat little nozzle, right? And I think yes. you mentioned you purchased that online. Yes. Now, could you also use like a spray bottle or some sort of mister or what other ways can we water our seedlings? Uh, you can use a mister. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not in a greenhouse. I'm in, in my house in my, in my, uh, in my, my special room. Um, just, you just have to make sure you don't get too much overspray. That's why I, that's why I use this type of nozzle in this, this water bottle. Can she, can you see that? Can you see this? I, no, I only see your camera screen. I don't see your computer screen. All right, give me one second. One moment, one moment, please. All right, we also had a question about perlite. So we had one person, person who their bag of perlite got wet and it's kind of like turned into like a heavy thing of concrete. Is it still usable or should they start fresh? Uh, it start fresh. Because there might there might also be some uh, mold or something in it. If it's if it's got all wet and it's been sitting there, I would I would I would start fresh. I, but that perlite, you could just just put it in your garden or put it in your yard. Don't throw it away. Uh, so we also had a question off of YouTube wanting to uh, asking about vermiculite. Uh, where are some good places to purchase it, and is it expensive? So I do know that you mentioned local nurseries often sell this. Uh, sometimes you might have to go to the section where they have indoor plants. Sometimes it's hiding there because it's in these smaller bags. Uh, but I've, it's been a little while since I bought that. Do you remember about the price range of that? Uh, 
don't remember the price range for vermiculite. It's not it's not very expensive at all. Oh, there you go. Can you see me now? I still see you, not your screen yet. Okay. There you go. All right. It's coming. There we go. All right. We see your PowerPoint. Okay. Great. Yeah, the vermiculite's not very, neither one of them is very expensive. You can get a, a pretty good sized bag of them for, for cheap. All right. So um, what about, uh, if you have any experience with grow bags and what, what are your thoughts on those? Um, I try to, <laughs> I try to grow back a couple of, a couple of times. Um, but I, I was not very successful. Uh, one of the things that, um, in one of our other presentations about container gardening, uh, was that watering, especially when it gets really, really hot, uh, when you have containers and grow bags is keeping up with the watering for, for, you know, the, for your plants to stay healthy and yes. setting up a drip irrigation system as we, for your potted and containers, uh, for your pots and containers, as, as weird as it sounds seems to be really, really helpful to have success with container gardening. And then they also have ones where you can feed, you know, you can add whatever types of uh, liquid fertilizer uh, you want into them and they can feed it through that watering system. So you can literally feed your plants every day. And like you mentioned with organics, it takes, sometimes it takes a little more and longer because the ratios, you know, the NPK of organic fertilizers are lower than synthetic. So you have to fertilize more often. And That's if you correct. set up that special irrigation system, you can feed through that irrigation system and have more success with your containers and grow bags and uh, different kinds of potted plants. Just as uh, when you're talking about organic fertilization, what, what I do, my rule of thumb is I, I, I fertilize every three weeks with, a, with liquid. So, the, uh, so, the, so like the fish emulsion and the molasses, I, I, I water every three weeks with that. All right, so we actually had a little a more specific question, and this is about sugar snap peas. Uh, what temperature should should you put frost cloth on to protect your sugar snap peas? That that's a, a very that's a, specific question. That's a specific question. Um, watch, I would if it if if it's get going to go below seventy, I would cover them. Sh sugar snap peas are are or they're, they're I, I would call them a, kind of a medium uh, cold weather hardy, but if it if it dip, if it dips too much into the 60s, it it'll 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 definitely start to start, start to harm them, and slow definitely will slow them down. That's true. That's true. The peas do like it a little bit warmer, but not too hot. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Larry, I uh, we had some questions. That you know, we of course this was about vegetables, starting vegetable seeds and uh, stuff like that. But uh, do you have any tips, or can this information carry over for flower? You know, starting flower seeds, and also if you want to prepare beds for flowers, uh, can we carry over some of the same information and techniques, or is is doing flowers completely different? No, you, you, the soil is soil. Good soil is good soil. You can you can transfer this into. Uh, and, and using flowers also and pollinators. Uh, we actually do that. I actually grow uh, pollinators in the house and then transplant them outside when it gets warm enough. Oh, what are some of the flowers you start inside? <clears throat> it depends. Uh, I like, uh, uh, oh my goodness. I, I like I like marigolds. I like, um, um, I like passion, the little passion fruit flowers. Those are just, just drop dead gorgeous. I like those. Um, we just, I just like a bunch of them. I, I get, I got, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, when it comes to flowers, I, I'm like Johnny Appleseed. I'll just, I'll just spread them everywhere. So I get them in packages, they're mixed packages. And then I just, I just put those out. I'm not a, I'm not a flower person as far as an expert. So that's, that's how I do it. 
All right. So this is a really good question, Larry. This is really good. Okay. What are the advantages and disadvantages of square foot beds versus a keyhole garden? Uh, I, 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 pref I prefer a square foot bed, uh, especially when, they, when I'm working with the, with younger students, because the younger students can concentrate on a square foot they, they can't concentrate on a football field full of rows and, and raised beds, but they can, they can concentrate on this. And, and this square foot could belong to them. Um, uh, a keyhole garden uh, plays a, does play a role in, in gardening. And if you, if you want to do keyhole gardening and uh, so that you can put your fertilizer in, and, and compost all in all in the same area that it does play a good a, a good way I don't do keyhole gardening I live in Capel Capel has rodents no matter where you live um, and uh, and keyhole gardening uh, the requirements for keyhole gardening is to in the center of the close to the center of the keyhole is that you have a base and then you put stuff in it I I compost like a crazy person, but, uh, uh, but because, but because of rodents, I, 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 I control it a different way. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, different people have different experiences yes. with yes. their compost and that's why there's so different me many methods to composting. Several. And, you know, you mentioned you, you use a lot of fish emulsion. Well, you know, I can tell you my dogs love fish emulsion. So if I use fish emulsion and I turn my back, they are in there rolling in it, pulling out my plants, licking it, all that sort of stuff. So I have to be real careful when I use fish emulsion. So a lot of times I'll use different types of fertilizers or I have to like do what my dogs aren't there. Uh, but a, you know, that we, stuff's a little stinky. <laughs> I also, uh, in, uh, in my long-term care for my garden, I also use a blood, blood meal and bone meal. Um, uh, blood meal, squirrels love that stuff. And they'll come from miles around, miles around just to dig up your garden to get to it. So, so yeah, you have to be depending on where you're at and what kind of wildlife you have. You you have to be cautious about what you use. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So uh, speaking of that, there is some interest in uh, square foot gardening. Yes. And so, do you happen to know of any maybe upcoming classes uh, that people can? Uh, can check out and also if this is a big thing uh with the grow with us series we can definitely look at having a class about square foot gardening but larry do you I, know any of them that might be coming up i i don't uh especially with this with uh with with covid covid surrounding us i don't know of, i i don't know of any classes that are actually coming up you, you might think about if there, if you're if there's an interest in square foot garden you might think about doing that in part of your series but uh I, I'm a firm believer in it. Um, uh, I have branched off as far as the what they call the males mix, which is the soil that that that, that he he uses. I use um, I I really don't follow that recipe. I use my own recipe, uh, but the methodology of the square foot and what to put in it and how much you can put in it, absolutely. You can you can grow 16 radishes in one square foot. I, before I, I took this class out of my head wouldn't have wrapped around that one because I'm always used to doing rows of them. Um, so yes, I, I thoroughly believe in the, in the square foot garden method. It is, it is, it is, you're right. It is mind blowing. And it's something I haven't tried personally, but that's definitely, we can look into for the series is uh, square foot gardening. And uh, we had a question about composting. And so I can say that on this series, we've done a class on vermicomposting and we've had Lauren Clark from turn. I uh, do a, a presentation about composting. And we've also had Bukashi composting. We've had two classes on that, one in English and one in Spanish about that. So if you are interested in that, if you don't mind sending an email, uh, I'll put my email address in there. I can send you the link so that you can watch those presentations. Uh, but Larry, you are a master composter too, right? Yes. Uh, do you wanna just maybe give some tips about starting off composting? Uh, yes. Uh, you, again, it depends on where, where you live. Um, I, um, uh, in my, in my, in my master composting class and, and, and also 
in the pra in the method of which we practice it at the community gardens, we use uh, we use a um, uh, we use shepherd bins, and these shepherd bins are they're just wire they're just three foot by three foot square uh, uh, wire cages. Um, and, um, and we just, when we put the materials in and we can talk about that if you'd like to, but, uh, but here at my house, uh, I don't use a shepherd's bin. I use, uh, I use, a, it's all, it's all self-contained. It's called an aero bin. It's A-E-R-O. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and the reason I did that is because my lovely bride went out one time and, uh, to put some stuff in the, into the shepherd's bin and then she walked back into the house and she said, is there anything else we can do with that compost and except what you're doing? And I said, but of course, dear. So I went and bought an aero bin, which is, it's about the size, about half the size of a refrigerator and it's all enclosed in. Uh, you just open the lid and you put stuff in it and you close it. And, um, and through time, compost comes out the bottom. Uh, if, if you want to do a shepherd's bin, you, got, you have to turn it and you have to turn it quite often. Uh, there are going to be critters in it. I'm telling you right now. So there's bugs and some other things in there. It doesn't bother me. I, they're just part of the compost, uh, as far as I'm concerned. But uh, uh, but they, you know, you you will get you get materials in there. Sometimes, you know, you get a possum that wanders by and kind of likes it and wants to climb in there to have babies. I mean, there's things that you need to be aware of that with the shepherd's man. So. That's it's a good point. Wide, it's because, wide open. It's wide yeah, open. I mean, because you're putting food scraps in there, which is exactly. a source of food yeah. for many other creatures, and yes. so it can, uh, yeah, it can, it can attract others. Yeah, it's but like a buffet. I, I have, Once they I, figure I, out, it's like a buffet. They'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll come around. Yeah. Why would you pass up on that, right? Yeah. All right. So we have had a question about moisture beads. So somebody was gifted some moisture beads, those things that swell and retain water, and then like release it over time. Uh, do you have any thoughts on those? No, I do not have any thoughts on those. So I, are those similar to the things that are in some diapers? Like, you know, for, for babies? I don't know. I'm not educated. I'm not educated on that. It, if it doesn't, if it doesn't break down, uh, I, for me, I wouldn't be interested in that. If it doesn't add something to the soil, I wouldn't be interested in that. Yeah, there's a, there's a, um, you know, I think for some really small containers, sometimes those are in there because you know yeah. you can't it yeah. can't hold that much water, and so they they use products like that, and sometimes yeah. like floral I'm arrangements. Not, I'm not I'm not I'm not versed in that at all. Right. Yeah. I've I've never I've seen them, but I haven't used them myself. Um. So. Uh, oh, and then. So yeah. So there's some uh com conversation a little bit more about composting. Uh. So coffee grounds, Larry, yes. they have to be composted or can you just put those directly in your garden? They need to be spent, of course. So just don't go to Starbucks and, and, and get a, a, a get fresh ground coffee because that's not, that's not good. But if it, after, after it goes through the machines and, uh, and you have coffee, you can, do, you can do anything you want with a coffee ground. I, I do a couple of things. I, I put them straight into my garden. I put them straight into my compost pile. I'll throw them out in the yard. I, I, I just, that's how I just dispense of them. We, my wife and I drink coffee every day and, and we just keep it in a tub. And when the tub gets about halfway full, I, sometimes halfway full, she reminds me and I'll take it outside and, and I'll just get rid of it. So. Yeah, I've done both too. I put it in my compost pile and I've just thrown it in different right. beds I have and different things like that. All right, so this is our last call for questions. If you have any other questions for Larry, please drop those into the chat and we'll get those answered. And we also had lots of our uh, participants share it, good information and links in there. So if you wanna check those out, uh, those will be available until we close. And also I wanna remind everybody that um, the Dallas Public Library will send out an email in a couple of days to everyone who pre-registered for this session. In that email, we'll include some links to some of our uh, past sessions that, that were about composting. Uh, we'll include some of these charts and, and uh, things that Larry shared in his presentation. We'll include that in there. And um, 
some other useful information that, that was shared in this presentation. We'll make sure those are all in there. Okay, so when I had said last call for questions, everybody listen, because now you have a bunch more. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. What do you do about little flies that seem to love your seed start? Say that one more time. Uh, so little flies. I guess like if you're getting maybe gnats or something like that, and oh. you're starting your seeds. Yep. 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 Uh, uh, don't water it so much. Is it as simple as that? <laughs> <laughs> Cut back on the water. I use, uh, I actually use neem oil to, uh, cause I have, I get, a, even in the house, you, 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 you get these little, uh, these little ants. So, um, uh, I use neem oil. I'll spray it with, uh, with neem oil. Yeah. And, um, I know it's not uncommon to get those, uh, uh, those, those gnats, like when you're doing worm composting and that they actually live in the soil. Right. So sometimes they could come from the soil that you like, perhaps like if you purchase soil or if the components you use to mix your soil. So that's, that, that can be a source of them, but they yeah. usually have a pretty short life cycle. And I've also, I heard this from Heather Rinaldi from Texas Worm Ranch. Oh, that, Heather. Yeah. I know Heather, right? Everybody loves yeah. Heather. Yeah. Uh, that the, the mosquito dunks, those little donuts that have the BT uh, bacterium in it to get the mosquito larva, that also works for fungus snaps. So if you have fungus gnats, you can actually crumble those donuts, those, those mosquito dumps, and like you can add them to your worm bin or to your soil and stuff like that. And that BT will help with those fungus gnats. Uh, so that's something else you can try. If fungus gnats is your problem, if you're having a different type of fly, it might not help with that. Um, and uh, so, oh, okay. Oh, do you want to do a plug for Master Gardeners? The Master Gardener Certification Program. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, I really have been out of contact with them. They uh, they are having a Master Gardening uh, uh, school this year. It's it be it's all online, um, and you can go to uh, you can go to the website uh, Dallas County Master Gardener web website and uh, and pre register. And uh, what they do is you uh, you sign up for it. Uh, uh, they uh, they have, as you can imagine, they have the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that want to take these courses. Uh, so they'll uh, they'll call you for uh, for an interview and uh, and then uh, and and get you in. I highly recommend if you're really if you have the time and you're interested in uh, in volunteering because that's the key for the master master gardening program is the volunteering. I, I highly recommend that you do that. It's a lot of fun meet a lot of great people. Right. Okay, so, uh, all right. I'm gonna take, read these last two questions and then we'll wrap up. Um, what about watering? Like, so when your seeds get started and you're still keeping them indoors and you have to water them, what about like watering from below? Like, you know, having a, like the saucer with some water versus watering from the top? What, once, once they germinate, that's, that's a really great question. Once they germinate, um, I, I have a tendency to, to wait till they get their uh, their second set of leaves or true leaves, and then I'll start watering from the bottom. Um, in my uh, in my in my light in my grow kit here, I, my tower that I have, it's actually there's trays. Uh, I have a tray within a tray, and in the tray, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll that's where I'll put my my soil, and then it'll my water, and then it'll it'll start waking it up. But I always wait. I wait till they get true leaves before I start doing that. Okay, so when they're just planted and and starting off and, and don't have their true leaves, we can mist from the top. But yes. once they get that set of true leaves, true leaves, it's good to water from the bottom. That is correct. That's what I do. Yeah. All right. All right. So we have a short uh, uh, survey. If you if, if our participants don't mind filling that out, it's going to help us with our programming. And I heard you loud and clear that we want to have a program on square foot gardening. So uh, we will get working on that. But if you don't mind taking the short survey, it will help us with that programming and deliver you exactly what you want to learn about and to make sure that we're delivering you good service and programming and quality. So uh, I would to thank you, Larry, so much for taking your time to, to share your information with us. And I got to tell you that, that the picture you showed us of your Capel greenhouse, that was amazing. 
that looks like a lot of hard work. And, um, you know, you do have a good point that, you know, if, if you're a little overwhelmed by seed starting, there are lots of different gardening clubs, school gardens that sell seedlings uh, as a fundraiser. And, you know, they've been very well cared for uh, and they're great quality stock. And that's always an option that you can purchase those starts to put out into your garden, uh, support some com local community and school gardens and have a successful plant because you know that they were grown the right way and they started with the correct seed and not a seed that maybe does better, you know, in New Jersey versus here. That is correct. <laughs> All right, and just to remind everybody that these programs are on the Dallas Public Library YouTube page. So they are under, if you go to playlists and go to Dallas Environmental Quality and Sustainability, you can see about, uh, about 15 of our past programs that deal with growing and also with general environmental topics. And they live there. So you can always find them and share them and rewatch them. And plus, if you pre-registered, be on the lookout for that email. It's gonna be sent to the address you registered for this program with. Uh, that will have a way for you to access this recording and a lot of other information, links and flyers that were shared today. And uh, we have another program in one week. Uh, it is going to be also Monday at noon and it's gonna be about uh, soul food from the garden, about growing, harvesting and preparing different types of greens from your garden. So with that, uh, and, with, and on behalf of the Dallas Public Library, I wanna thank Larry, I wanna thank the Dallas Seed Library, the Dallas Library staff, and all of you for spending your time with us today. We hope this was helpful and we hope to see you again and stay safe. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.